Ladies and gentlemen, it's our pleasure to introduce uh, Gemma Ricetta from Barcelona, and she will present us uh, familiar lipomagnesemia. hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gemma Ariseta and welcome to this webinar entitled Familial Hypomagnesemia with Hypercalciuria and Nephrocalcinosis. I have no disclosures to declare. Magnesium is the second most abundant intracellular cation. Magnesium is essential for several vital functions such as neurotransmission, cardiac conductance, blood glucose and blood pressure regulation, and proper function of more than 600 enzymes as ecofactor. For instance, ATP has to bind magnesium to be biologically active. Clinical presentation of hypomagnesemia is mainly explained by its action on nervous and cardiovascular systems and varies with the severity and extent of hypomagnesemia. Most frequent symptoms are muscle cramps, paresthesias, hyperreflexia, convulsions, ataxia, depression, fatigue, coma, arrhythmias, hypertension, chondrocalcinosis, in children, failure to thrive, basal ganglia calcifications, and sometimes intellectual disability, coma, and even death. Main body content of magnesium is stored at muscles and bone. And blood magnesium concentration reflects the equilibrium between intestinal magnesium reabsorption and renal magnesium excretion. Intestinal magnesium reabsorption is generally poorly regulated and depends on magnesium intake. The kidneys are the primary regulators of magnesium homeostasis. <clears throat> As said, kidney, the kidney is the primary regulator of magnesium balance and can modify the amount of magnesium excretion in urine to restore magnesium homeostasis. Ionized magnesium, around 80% of total magnesium, is freely filtered in the glomerulus and about 95 to 99% is recovered along, along the nephron. The main location for renal magnesium reabsorption with 65 to 75% is the thick ascending lip of Henlen. Despite only 10% of the filtered magnesium is reabsorbed in the distal tubule, it determines the final urinary magnesium excretion since no reabsorption takes place beyond this segment. <clears throat> the main location for renal magnesium reabsorption is the thick ascending lip on helmet. Here, magnesium and calcium transport occur in a paracellular mode by clouding 16 and clouding 19 proteins that are responsible for the pore selectivity of the tight junction. Clouding 14 acts as a negative regulator of the divalent calcium permeation at this segment. The lumen positive potential difference is the major driving force for the paracellular magnesium and calcium reabsorption and is created by two different mechanisms. Secretion of potassium by Ronke and the action of the sodium potassium chloride a specific channel at the luminal site and also by the chloride excretion by the chloride channel and also by the action of sodium potassium ATPase at the basolateral um, portion. Further, disruption of this voltage difference due to other primary tubulopathies such as Barter syndrome or gain of function mutation of the calcium sensing receptor encoding gene or secondary to different medications may also cause renal magnesium loss. 
However, the fine tanning of renal magnesium reabsorption occurs in the distal tubule, and here the reabsorption is transcellular by the apical transient receptor potential melastatin type 6, which is specific, and it's a divalent cation channel, while the vasolateral magnesium extrusions occur through the solute carrier family 41 member 3 an overplayer in magnesium homeostasis. Here, the negative membrane potential is a prerequisite for magnesium reabsorption. Again, impaired electrolyte transportation to inhibited tubular diseases or secondary to drugs directly affecting the distal tubule may also cause magnesium loose in urine. <clears throat> Familiar hypomagnesemia with hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis was first described by Michaelis and Castrillo in 1972. This is an autosomal recessive inherited disease characterized by the presence of polyuria, polydipsia, urinary tract infections, hyperuricemia, hypomagnesemia, and severe loss of magnesium in urine, and also severe hypercalciuria. Patients present with bilateral medullar nephrocalcinosis, kidney stones, and sometimes low citrate in urine and incomplete distal RTA picture. Characteristically, this disease um, presents with hyperparathyroidins with increased PTH levels before the onset of the CKD that uh, appears around teenagers or, or the second decade of life. Um, remarkably, 42% of family members also present with kidney stones and hypercalciuria. A few years later, Mayer et al. described that some patients with familiar hypomagnesemia with hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis also exhibit an ocular involvement with reduced visual ability, macular colobomata, retinopathy, nystagmus, and severe myopia. The prevalence of familiar hypomagnesemia with hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis is unknown. This is a very rare disorder, estimated less than 1 in 1 million population, with about 200 affected patients with confirmed genetic diagnosis. However, familiar hypomagnesemia with hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis is likely to have been underdiagnosed due to a lack of awareness of this disorder. High fractional urinary excretion of magnesium is always found. However, magnesium and hypomagnesemia may be overlooked in affected patients with advanced CKD. In some patients, excess of PTH level even before the onset of CKD may help the diagnosis as shown by Conrad in 2008. By, gen by genuine positional cloning in 1999, Simon et al. identified that familiar hypomagnesemia with hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis was caused by pathogenic variants in the Claudine 16 gene, which encodes the tight junction protein Claudine 16, formerly named Paracelin 1. As explained, Claudine 16 is a protein that is crucial for the paracellular reabsorption of magnesium and calcium and in the thick ascending leak of Helner's loop. Inactivating mutations of the Claudine gene result in urinary loss of magnesium and calcium. Some years later, in 2006, Conrad et al. studied a Swiss family and eight Spanish Hispanic families affected with severe hypomagnesemia due to renal wasting, nephrocalcinosis, and progressive renal failure, but without mutations in the Claudine cysteine gene. Affected individuals in those families also have severe visual impairment characterized by macular colobomata, 
significant myopia and horizontal neck nystagmus. Conrad discovered a second form of the disease that was caused by mutations in the Claudine 19 gene, which encodes the Claudine 19, uh, a protein member of the Claudine family that is also highly expressed in the tangential of the thick ascending lip of Hannes loop, as well as in the retinal epithelium. Most Spanish patients had a founder mutation. Claudine 16 and Claudine 19 proteins form a paracellular cation channel. Claudine 16 increases paracellular permeability to sodium, while Claudine 19 decreases paracellular permeability to chloride. Thus, a functional synergy between these two claudines leads to a lumen positive voltage to drive magnesium and calcium reabsorption in a paracellular way. What about treatment? Unfortunately, the treatment of, of this disease is only supportive. We, um, there, are there are prescribed oral magnesium supplements trying to avoid symptoms, but most of the patients persist with low magnesium. Diazides uh, may reduce hypercalciuria, and also potassium citrate is used to to protect and to avoid progression of nephrocalcinosis. It is important to, to be cautious with serum potassium that in many patients may increase um, as uh, associated with progressing CKD. It's important to avoid acquired renal damage and the only um, curative treatment by now is kidney transplant. The disease doesn't recur and disease carriers can be donors. In Spain, Dr. Claveri Martin published the cohort of 31 patients from 27 unrelated families. 100% of patients exhibit calcium 19 mutations, and as described, most of them had ocular involvement. At the end, you can see here that most of the patients were homozygous for the, for the Spanish mutation in the Claudine 19 gene. Contemporary data of our series, um, also including 30, 30 patients, um, we can see that the age of diagnosis varies, but the mean age was 3.7 years. And characteristically, um, a portion of patients, 17% of them, uh, has already uh, um, reached end stage kidney disease by four years of age. Overall, uh, one third of patients in our series have reached end stage kidney disease. Most of them are transplanted, and the renal, the renal survival, um, the median was 25 years. We observe a more severe phenotype in females, a thing that has been also described and published earlier, and on between the subgroup of patients who reach end stage kidney disease, 80% of them were females, whereas only 40% of females remain in the in conservative treatment. Most patients, as described, also have ocular involvement. Uh, what about other series? It has been published, and um, this is the French series. It's quite similar to the Spanish one. Also, they have more patients with Claudine 19 mutations than Claudine 16. And they describe that progression to end stage kidney disease was frequent, and 50% of patients were on on progression, they, here they, the difference is because they consider CKD stage 3, whereas we consider end stage kidney disease. Some studies have described worse prognosis in Claudine 19 mutations, but there are no um, comparative studies in big series. It remains unclear why patients with familiar hypomagnesemia and nephrocalcinosis develop end stage kidney disease. It is thought that hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis contribute to the development of end-stage kidney disease, but animal studies suggest that maybe 
also an underlying developmental tubular defect in this disease. Let's talk about the differential diagnosis of familial hypomagnesemia with hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis. There are several situations and the main, the main differential diagnosis is with other causes of hypercalciuria hypomagnesemia. And one cause is the autosomal dominant hypocalcemia um, caused by gain of function mutations in the calcium sensing receptor. Patients may have hypomagnesemia, but also hypocalcemia, kidney stones, and what is very different, they have normal or inappropriately low PDH. Patients with Barton, what is, has been named Barton syndrome type 5, that is also gain of mutations of calcium sensing receptors, may mimic familiar hypomagnesemia with hypercalcemia and nephrocalcinosis. And in general, uh, patients with Barton syndrome type 1 and 2, and also um, classic Barton syndrome, by disturbing the lumen positive potential, may also be responsible for magnesium wasting in the urine. Other non hypercalcemic hypomagnesemias may um, be considered also at the differential diagnosis. Barter syndrome type 3 and type 4 um, where mutations of the chloride channel and the Bartin gene and coding gene interfere with the generation of lumen positive potential. At the distal tubal Gittelman syndrome, which specifically impairs affects negative the specific um, a magnesium specific channel, T or P and C, and also isolated dominant hypomagnesemia, its syndrome or isolated recessive hypomagnesemia may also affect um, the, um, the general um, reabsorption of magnesium at this level. Other diseases like HF1 beta nephropathy, mitochondrial disease and other genetic disease may also um, impair magnesium reabsorption. Um, recently, a diagnostic algorithm for genetic causes of hypomagnesemia based on clinical findings as presence of hypercalciuria and or extrarenal symptoms and also based on inherited transmission mode has been published and I recommend you this very useful algorithm to, um, to um, go into the differential of a patient with hypomagnesemia. And last thing, we cannot forget the most frequent causes of hypomagnesemia are medications, so common common far and drugs as proton pump inhibitors, diuretics, cisplatin, immunosuppressants, and also anti-EGF receptors or antimicrobials may be the most frequent cause of hypomagnesemia of renal origin and always need to be considered. Thank you for your attention. This is my last slide and I'm now open to questions. Is there any question? Thank you so much. Do you have three kids at the moment? Do you have a question? But I would like to refer to home. Excuse me? You just have one minute if you want to. Yes, please. If you want to send your question, go ahead. But anyway, it was a very, very nice uh, view of uh, this disease, very clear for all the nephrologists involved in ERCnet. And uh, if we don't 
have any questions, we we will close the webinar and uh, thank uh, Gima for this talk. Thank you. Uh, I I think we received some questions in advance. I don't. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. I will try to to answer that questions. If you let me check one thing, please. I can. Okay, I I think that we received a question in, before this morning about how can we distinguish between autosomal recessive form of hypomagnesemia with hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis for the autosomal dominant form. So my answer is that first there is a different inherent inheritance transmission mode, also the clinical characteristics. Um, in autosomal dominant hypercalcemia, um, what is um, very different from um, familiar hypomagnesemia and nephrocalcinosis is that in autosomal dominant hypocalcemia, PTH level is normal or inappropriately low for for the calcium level, whereas in familiar hypomagnesemia, many patients have increased have increased um, PTH level. And also, many of these diseases, they, they is, is important to, to have the genetic diagnosis because the confirmation nowadays requires the genetic di diagnosis. Is it okay to go to the second question I received? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, another another person sent a, a question about if familial hypomagnesemia and hypercalciuria and nephrolithiasis without associated ocular or hearing impairment could be only milder form of the autosomal dominant form of a variant of hypomagnesemia with hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis. I need to say that the outcome of patients with familiar hypomagnesemia is very variable, as, as, as I showed you. And it has been described, Dr. Conrad, that there is a relationship between the, um, the impairment of a protein. Patients who have no protein have a worse pro outcome than patients who have a minimal amount of protein is still active. But in, even in siblings with the same genotype, the outcome can be, and the clinical expression may be variable. And so possibly there are other potential factors who, which uh, are important for the outcome. It's not only the date of diagnosis and the quality of treatment, but maybe other modifying factors that we don't know. As well, there are not good studies uh, compare the outcome of both um, type 1, that means Claudine 16 versus Claudine 19 mutations, because at the north of Europe and Central Europe, Claudine 16 mutations are more prevalent, whereas at the south of Europe and also the north of Africa, um, Claudine 19 mutations are more prevalent and, and uh, up to now, it has not been any good study comparing both diseases. However, as I said, it's important to confirm the diagnosis by genetic testing. There are several uh, labs um, um, that offer the genetic testing for these diseases, and I, I recommend you to check the Orphanet uh, website there are many labs there are also there is uh, we we belong to a research consortium named renal tube and if you we go if you go to our website we we offer the genetic diagnosis not for all but for some of these diseases many of them and it's a research project and if you join to the research project it's free of cost I don't know if any any anyone uh, would like to ask any other question. Okay, I have more questions. There is a question about 
um, the use of magnesium citrate as We don't have anything uh, on the dashboard. The, okay, the, so the... we will close the um, discussion there and again... Excuse me? Excuse me? Go ahead, go ahead, Shima. Go ahead. No, no. There is there is there is a, there is a question about the use of magnesium citrate as soup supplement. I think that's that's good. It has to be prepared as a galenic formula, but I think it's it's right to use that. And there is another. Uh, it's another question about if hypomagnesemia reduces the onset of CKD with oliguria and urea. Well, I think that this disease, because the, um, this is, uh, and the patients have severe nephrocalcinosis and um, they are an impaired ability to concentrate during the, the, the even on, st on a stage kidney disease, they, they, they preserve uh, diuresis, so oliguria is not a problem. Um, someone is talking about mutations of another channel, CNN M2. Uh, if anyone has any any patients, I think I refer Dr. Bueno to to some reference um, experts that, of course, are working in this gene and probably they have patients as well. Hypomagnesemia, yes, the hypomagnesemia in reduce. It is reduced when the onset of end stage kidney disease. Some patients may have normal, but others still um, have a magnesium, a low magnesium, but not not as low or as severe that um, previously. But still, it is variable. Some patients normalize magnesium, and those are the ones who are difficult to diagnose. Okay, the best magnesium supplements. I think it's, uh, the best is what is available in your own country. There are not very um, magnesium uh, oxide is quite good for for the for the GI. There are several supplements different in every in every country. Uh, one has to distribute in different doses within the day, trying to to not to cause um, GI discomfort, but uh, many patients re receive a large amount of magnesium, but sometimes I, I recommend not using such a large dose because magnesium will remain low, and the, the aim of the treatment is to keep the patient without muscle, muscle symptoms, but not normalized magnesium, which may be impossible. Okay, another question. Lots of questions here. Uh, um, okay, so uh, I don't know if and there is a question about Claudine 14, um, and and if if it has any effect on uh, familiar hypomagnesemia outcome. I think we need to study this more. We are we are trying to study other modifying genes in this disease, but still. At least myself, we don't have additional information. Okay, so there is a question about also viability among different magnesium preparations. I don't know if this has been very well studied. In in the gut, most of the magnesium reabsorption is not is not regulated, so it's more related to the amount of magnesium. And at least in my experience, the best is trying to find the one that um, is well tolerated, better tolerated by the patient. Okay. Okay, I think we we have gone through all the questions.
Jak orkest? Okay. Can this syndrome recruit after transplant? No, no. The 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 disease is cured by the so, transplant. It doesn't recur. In my experience, all patients have normal because this is the the pathway is restored by the graft. So the disease is does not recur. Okay. And the question about incomplete distal RTA. This is related to the to the nephrocalcinosis and the um, interstitial um, loss of the the gradient, and also the impair. There is an impairment in the in the proton pump um, extrusion of of the protons. But this is secondary to nephrocalcinosis, to interstitial fibrosis. And it's important to know that to differentiate these patients with hypomanicemia and patients with distal RTA. And the difference is that in distal RTA, whenever you correct acidosis, magnesium is reduced in urine as well as calcium, whereas in familiar hypomanicemia and nephrocalcinosis, Despite acidosis correction, the correction of acidosis, both calcium and magnesium remains very high in urine. We do need to do native nephrectomy. And this is, re uh, and this is, I think, is more based on your own group experience about nephrectomy in polyuric patients. We have performed transplants in patients with this disease without an nephrectomy and had no problem at all. I think this was the last question. Uh, do you still read the questions? Okay, so I think that this is a very rare disease. Um, it's important to think about that, even in the in the lack of presence of mag of magnesium, uh, low magnesium. But whenever you see a patient with severe nephrocalcinosis, think about this disease, and and only I I think before closing the session, I need to announce. The next webinar and that will be on that will be held in June 12 um, by Dr. Rosetto Ra, um, who will talk about the renal involvement in tuberous sclerosis complex. Okay, so again, Gima, thank you so much, and we will close the webinar right now. So have a great evening, uh, all of you. Bye bye. Okay, thank you so much for your patience. Bye-bye. <clears throat>